Well, good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning live stream here from Linwood Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Hopefully you got a copy of the order we're going to be following. I sent it out via email yesterday. I'll try to announce and make clear everything that you need to know as we move uh, through the service today. Also, you'll notice I have these two little earbud headphones out of my ears. I didn't get my ears pierced or anything like that. This is serving as the microphone to give us a little better audio quality on the live stream. But with that in view then, let's go ahead and begin with the time of prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that today is your day and that we can from afar gather around your word to hear your voice to us. We pray, Lord, that the word that we hear today we would receive with true faith, knowing that your word is powerful and effective to bring about all that you intend. And may, Lord, it fall upon us as those who are strengthened and built up in our most holy faith. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we're going to sing a hymn together. It's hymn number 14 in the Red Trinity Hymnal. The title is New Songs of Celebration Render. It's number 14. This time we'll make confession of our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I know many of you have the Creed memorized, but if you'd like to follow along, you can, of course, find any printed copy that you might have available. And if you have the Red Trinity Hymnal, you can look on page 845 in the back of that Red Trinity Hymnal. Also, while I give you a moment, just a reminder that if anybody in the congregation does not have a copy of the Trinity Hymnal and wants one,
will probably help you follow along with these live streams, please let us know. And a copy for you to have or to borrow at least uh, can be provided for you. Let's then make confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed as we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time we'll sing another hymn to the Lord. It's number 629 in the Red Trinity Hymnal. The title is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, 629. time we'll join together in a time of congregational prayer uh, as is our regular pattern I'll be following the general outline of the church family prayer requests that we usually include in the bulletin in addition to some other requests that we've received throughout the week uh, if you have a particular request please make that known in your hearts to the Lord as we join together as a congregation now in prayer let us pray our Heavenly Father how we thank you that you are the one true, eternal, and all-glorious God, that you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, dwell on high, far above all that you have created, but also those who are lowly and contrite and humble in heart. And we would come today, Lord, to humble ourselves before your majestic presence, because we know, O Lord, that not only are we creatures, specks of dust, in the vast ocean of the universe. 
but we are also sinners that have transgressed your holy character and holy law. Yet, Lord, we also know that you are a gracious God who delights to forgive us. And so we pray, O Lord, that as we gather today around your word, even distant from one another, we know that we are not distant from you because your spirit dwells in each one of us through faith. So, Lord, work through your power to bring about all that you intend for us, your people. May especially you grant us strength and encouragement in our faith that we might have a firm and sure assurance of your love and forgiveness to us and that we in thankfulness for that might through faith hear the word and the commandment that you give us and walk in true and sincere obedience and love to you. Lord, in this time of trial and difficulty that faces not only uh, the area we live, but our entire nation and indeed the whole world, we would lift up before you the governing authorities at the various levels. Help them, Lord, to have good information. Help them to have wisdom, to make good and sound decisions. Help them to balance all the concerns before them as they determine what is truly for the common good of all. We do pray that you would keep us free from sickness and from ailments, but then your merciful hand would be upon those who do fall ill. We would especially, Lord, remember those in our church family with such difficulties and health trials. We pray, Lord, for Julie Bacon, Lorraine DeVries, Randy Morris, for Ralph Van Winkle in his upcoming back surgery, for Bob Johnson in his continued recovery, for Marie Sketchley, and for Frank Wayland. Bless each one of these, your saints, as well as others who struggle with uh, chronic pain or difficulties or health struggles of various kinds. Lord, we know you gave us bodies, bodies that are subject to sin and to weakness. But we thank you, Lord, for the promise of new bodies, which will be freed from corruptibility and will be granted incorruption and resurrection from the dead. We pray similar things, Lord, for those individuals and, fam and church family members and who are not able to get out of their homes, not simply uh, because of the uh, stay-at-home orders, but because, Lord, of various weaknesses and infirmities. We pray for the Quarter family, the Locks, for the Vandervates, for Fran Anderson, Harriet Hover, and Doug Polonis. But we do pray, Lord, for all of us as we face particular difficulties and trials and stressful moments, as many of us are not able to exercise the freedoms we usually enjoy. We're not able to gather for church in person. We do pray that in this meantime, we would cling to you, the living God, and the hope we have in you, but that you would be merciful to us and grant that we, again, especially might gather together to worship and be an encouragement to one another. We pray for those serving in the military. We remember especially Jessica and Junior and Tom. Bless them in their service. May they be a good testimony to you and your grace. We pray for uh, the expectant mothers that may be among us and also those who have recently given birth. We remember especially Belhika and her new baby. Bless them together. May everything go well in these first few weeks and bless uh, their family as they welcome this new baby into the world. Pray for mothers as they care for their infant children or young children. Give them strength and encouragement. And not just for them, Lord, but for every phase of development. Give those of us who are parents wisdom to train and nurture and teach them not only how they might live in this world and use their gifts to serve others, but most importantly, how they might live to serve you and be faithful members of your church. We remember as well, Ingru, thank you for his successful licensure exams, and we do pray that you would bless uh, his work among us and among this region as he shares the word of God and seeks to build others up in faith uh, may Lord, you bless him and Jasmine as well in their new marriage together. We pray for our regional church, especially, Lord, give you thanks uh, that uh, Dr. Bill Dennison is able to come and serve as a pastor at the Emmanuel OPC in Kent. Thank you for answering our prayers. We pray all that go, would go well with his move to the region. We do pray as well for pastors Dan Dillard and Rich Miller and their health struggles for other pastors too. We thank you as well. Uh, that the Colville congregation was able to call uh, a minister to serve them. We pray that it all go, would go well with Mr. Ryan Woods and his travel and move there and his settling in that congregation, and especially, Lord, as we seek to arrange an ordination service in these difficult times. We pray for other congregations as they continue to search for pastors. Give them faithful men 
who will proclaim the word to them without fear, but also shepherd and love the flock as Christ would have them. And Lord, we pray your rich blessing upon all that we say and do today, and especially on your word that goes forth to build up and strengthen and encourage your people. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, we turn our attention to the reading and the teaching of God's word. And before we do that, we'll prepare our hearts as we turn to hymn 303 in the Red Trinity Hymnal. It's entitled, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. time we turn now to our scripture teaching from the word of God. We'll be looking today at Romans chapter 9, continue our study through this wonderful epistle of Paul to the Romans. We've looked at, of course, in two separate sermons at verses 1 to 5, and now moving more towards the heart and middle of the chapter in verses 6 through 13. So as you turn there, I remind you that these words that Paul writes are not merely his words, but they are, in fact, the inspired, the infallible, and the errant words of the living God. Again, as we said, Romans chapter 6, or excuse me, Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At, this, at the appointed time I will return. And Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, 
or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Thus far, the reading of God's word today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your holy word, and we pray, Lord, that as we study it today, you would grant us wisdom and bless us in the knowledge and faith of the Savior, the Lord Jesus, and his electing love and grace that is revealed therein. Give us wisdom, O God, that we might better understand your word and live for you in love through it. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, beloved church, I have a question for you. How many of you believe that God's word is powerful and will accomplish that which he purposes for it? I think most of us would say an emphatic yes. Of course we believe that God's word is powerful. We've experienced that in our own lives. We've seen how it's changed us. Hopefully we see how it continues to change us. We've seen it change other people's lives throughout history. Of course, God's word is powerful. Is that not basic and fundamental to our Christian faith? Well, I think all of us will confess that honestly and truly, but think about it more in these terms. How many of you from time to time might get a little frustrated with how God is bringing about his plan? Now, you might say to me, well, I never get frustrated with God. Of course not. That would be irreverent. Okay, now think about it more honestly. How many of you perhaps are in relationships where things can be very difficult from time to time? And you've prayed to the Lord, and you've asked that he would work through his word to bring about change, but he hasn't brought about that change yet. How many of you get a little bit frustrated with that? How many of you sometimes wonder, Lord, <laughs> I've been praying. I've been reading my Bible. I've been talking about what God's word says to people, but there doesn't seem to be any change. How many of you are in other kinds of difficult situations where you're dealing with other kinds of miseries, trials, or unanswered prayers, and it just seems as if God isn't doing exactly what you want in the time you want it? And you see, sometimes we convince ourselves that we're not really upset with God. We're upset with the other people around us. But the minute we get upset, what are we doing except wondering in our hearts, has God's word and has God's plan failed for us? You see, even though I think we're going to be quick to answer this question, has the word of God failed, with an emphatic no, we need to appreciate why that question would be one that the apostle would ask. Because, of course, Israel was the people of God. They had heard the gospel. They had seen Jesus come. Yet how many among those people believed in the Lord? Not many, but a handful. Only a remnant were saved. The vast majority either rejected Jesus or helped to put him to death at his crucifixion. And not only that, after his resurrection, of which there was sufficient proof given to all men, as we saw just a few weeks ago in our Easter sermon, the Jewish people, by and large, continue to not believe. And so here's the situation, a situation we face in our own personal lives, but a situation that Paul faced in his life. Here you have a large group of people that were God's people, the children of Abraham, but they have not believed in the Lord. You see, if you look at it from that perspective, you can understand why the Apostle Paul asked this question. Has the word of God indeed failed? The answer to that question is an emphatic no. And in order to show us why that's the case, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9 pushes us back to the fundamental principles of our redemption, that which stands rock bottom at the solid foundation of God's plan to bring us redemption. And that redemption goes back further than our having faith and believing in the Lord. It goes back further than that effectual call that God gives us to trust in Christ and be saved individually. It goes back even beyond the work of Jesus on the cross to die for us. Indeed, the rock-bottom fundamental principle governing everything God does 
is his eternal plan that precedes our lives, that precedes all of history. And at the heart of that plan for our redemption is this doctrine or principle of election. That's what the Apostle Paul is pressing us to see. That the power behind the word of God in his intention to bring about salvation is this idea of election. Whereby from all eternity God appoints those whom he intends and desires to save. And promises in that eternal plan to most certainly and infallibly bring about their redemption. So in, other, in order to understand and appreciate this doctrine and how the Apostle Paul unfolds it here, we need to see that he doesn't first go directly back to that plan to help us to see all the details. First, he goes back in history to the proto-history, the beginning history of the Bible, namely to the time of the patriarchs. And he uses the time of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis, namely with Abraham and his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and then with Jacob and his two sons, excuse me, Isaac and his two sons, Jacob and Esau, and he helps us see how this principle of election existed all the way back in the beginning and indeed continues to exist even to the apostles' present day and even to our day. So in under, order to understand Paul's teaching about the elect in Israel, we need to do three things. First of all, we need to look and see what is Paul's basic answer to this question. Let's understand it clearly and precisely on its own before we dig into the history. But then secondly, we need to look at how Paul illustrates or shows this doctrine evident in the time of Abraham in his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And then thirdly, we'll see how that same principle continues in the time of Isaac with Jacob and Esau. Again, the point here is to see this election of Israel throughout the periods of history. But let's look at the first point. Before we jump to the details of the narrative, because he's reminding us of a story and we have to go through the details of the story, let's first understand the basic point and answer Paul gives to this implicit question. Has the word of God failed? And the answer is no. Why is that? Well, because fundamentally the promises given to Israel as a nation were directed in the true spiritual sense of those promises, not to national Israel as an external body, but instead to the spiritual Israel. Now, we know from the previous verses that there was an external status as the people of God that Old Testament Israel had. We'll talk more about that in summary in a minute, just as we did in the previous sermon. But here the apostle uses two phrases to make this clear point, that there is a spiritual Israel within the nation of Israel that truly loves and believes in God. And what are those two phrases? Well, notice first in verse 6, he tells us that not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Here he uses that phrase Israel in a kind of double sense. There is an Israel according to the flesh, an Israel in an external capacity, but then there is a true Israel within the Israel. So then there's that first phrase, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. But likewise, in verse 8, he uses a different phrase. Here, he describes this reality in these words. He says, it is not the natural children, the children of the flesh, who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. So here we have a distinction between Israel merely according to the flesh, but then Israel born according to promise. If we look elsewhere in the Bible, namely in Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul uses this language. He speaks of an Israel born according to the flesh, merely by natural descent, but then also an Israel according to the Spirit, born through God's supernatural power, reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. So then we have this distinction, this distinction between Israel in a national corporate community sense and then Israel in the internal spiritual sense. This isn't the only place where he's made this distinction. If you go back to the book of Romans in chapter 2, there we read this very thing 
reading about uh, in terms of circumcision. We read in verse 28 of Romans chapter 2, he says, A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is a circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Notice the use of the language here. We have inward and outward. We have physical and we have that by the spirit. We have that which is merely on the outside and that which is a circumcision of the heart. This is a fundamental distinction that helps us understand what is happening in the plan of God. There is, as we often say, a visible aspect to the church and there is an invisible aspect to the church. And what Paul is saying is that the promises of the Old Testament are ultimately governed and directed to the spiritual Israel. And that spiritual Israel, that internal Israel, is governed by this idea of God's electing choice. You see how the apostles moving backwards, backwards from faith, which we exercise in response to God's word, to the work of the spirit to call us effectually by his infinite power. And then behind that even further, God's eternal choice to bring about salvation for those whom he desires. And Paul's point is this in this section is to demonstrate and make clear that it was never the case in the Old Testament that God's most certain infallible promises for salvation and for the redemption of Christ, that those promises were always intended for the elect and for the elect alone in that spiritual ultimate sense. Now, does this mean that Paul rejects the significance or importance of the visible external aspects of being an Israelite? The answer to that question is an emphatic no. I, and there's lots of ways to demonstrate it, but we've already done that in a previous sermon, so I'm going to just focus on one thing here. Notice here that the question is, who are Abraham's true children? The answer, of course, is those who are elect and those who have true faith. But notice how in chapter 9, verse 4, he speaks of the Israelites in their corporate and national capacity as having the blessing of being adopted as sons. Theirs is the adoption, verse 4. Israel had an external, visible, national status that was special, and that was being considered adopted sons of God. And they had many privileges, both the elect and non-elect among them, as they were part of that nation, being under God's special care and protection having certain blessings that they would enjoy in the land, having access to all of God's revelation. As in Romans 2, so here in Romans 9, Paul does not reject the significance and place and importance of the visible side of being an Israelite. And so also we today. We put the emphasis properly, as we should, on the internal spiritual realities. It is election at work in the heart of us as individuals, that brings the power of the Holy Spirit to change us. But that does not negate or bring to nothing the visible church, and it's important in our lives. It is true, the visible aspect of the church serves the invisible. The word of God, the means of grace, the external blessings of being in covenant with God and in his church fundamentally serve to promote and encourage the spiritual invisible realities of our faith. But nevertheless, the Apostle Paul here is taking a direct shot at the Jewish mindset that was very prevalent in his day. And what was that mindset? Well, it's, uh, it's not just a Jewish mindset. It's a very human mindset. It's one that Christians can fall into very easily. And that's the idea that if, we're children, if we are Christians and our kids go to church and we assume they're Christians and everybody else here who's in the visible church, that that automatically, infallibly makes somebody a Christian. Now, I'm not saying that we don't exercise a judgment of charity to all those who have professed their faith. We do. But we do not equate absolutely membership in the visible church with spiritual salvation. The Jews often did. Oh, yes, if you apostatized, if you rejected the God of Abraham, then you could be kicked out of Israel. If you were out of the visible Israel, you were considered out of the invisible Israel. But the 
common perception among leaders and people was that if you were a physical descendant of Abraham, you were automatically, by virtue of your birth, the heir of all the gifts of redemption that God promised them. Not so, Paul says. Within national Israel, there was always a spiritual Israel, a remnant that would be saved, the elect that God chose. And while it might appear on the surface that God's word failed for the whole nation as they rejected the Messiah to come, it did not fail for those whom God intended to save. So that's the basic answer. There are really two Israels. There's a spiritual and there's a visible. There's a supernaturally born children of Abraham, and there is simply naturally born children of Abraham. The promise goes to the elect, the children of the promise, the children born according to the Spirit. Okay, if I'm a Jew, I hear that, and I say, well, that's a nice theory, Paul. How do you prove it? I mean, this sounds like a, a new teaching to me. That's not what I seem to read in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it says that the sons of Abraham will be blessed and be a blessing to the world. Where in the Old Testament can you prove your point? Well, it's very interesting. The Apostle Paul here appeals directly to the Old Testament, and he goes back to the beginning. He goes back to the father of all true Israelites, namely Abraham. This is a very strategic and brilliant move by the Apostle Paul, because, of course, there was no one greater in the Old Testament in the Jewish mind than Abraham. And if you're going to claim to be a son of Abraham, there's no better place than the story of Abraham to go back to to see if these things are the case. This is a reminder that the apostles, in all their teaching, based it on the Old Testament. It's not as if the Old Testament teaches one thing, and now the apostles in the New Testament come and say, hey, here's something new and different that God forgot to tell us. No, both the Old and New Testament tell a coherent story of redemption through Christ to come. And the Apostle Paul highlights this idea of election in the time of Abraham. So that's our second point, as we see this principle of election play out in the time of Abraham. Now, what phrase here is appealed to to summarize how this works in the time of Abraham? Well, here it tells us in verse 8 that there are the children of the flesh, the natural children, and there are the children of the promise. Now, there's a reason why Paul summarizes the principle of election playing out in Abraham's children in these terms, because it focuses and highlights what is unique and emphasized in the Abrahamic period. And what is that? Well, let me do it very simply for you. Typically speaking, we identify Abraham as the patriarch who illustrates faith and justification by faith. Again, there's other things illustrated there. I'm not saying that's the only thing, but that's the emphasis. We say that Abraham illustrates faith and righteousness by faith. But when we turn to Isaac and especially Jacob, we have a different doctrine emphasized. If Abraham exemplifies faith, what does Jacob illustrate in his life? Well, it's the idea of sanctification and growth in grace. Abraham had some ups and downs, but overall, his life was characterized by a true and firm faith. Jacob, on the other hand, even as his name indicates, was a deceiver. And he was a man who grew, and we can see that growth in grace. So what we see then is this idea of faith through the promise flowing out of election in the story of Abraham. But then when we turn to Isaac, especially with Jacob, we see the idea of election not being based on works. So that's a big map of how this is going to go through. But when we look again at Abraham, we find as we read through the story, the emphasis is upon faith and the promise being the root of what true children of Abraham are. Again, as we just glance over and survey the story of the patriarch Abraham, we find that this point is made gradually and progressively throughout. From the beginning, the idea of the promise to Abraham focusing on his children and his descendants comes right at the beginning. If you go back to Genesis chapter 12, you read about the first call of Abraham, at this point named Abram. And what does it say there? Well, in verse 2, God gives this promise, and these promises summarize the 
covenant with Abraham. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Again, implied in this promise is that from him will come children, will come a great nation, and that nation will be blessed and indeed be a blessing to the earth through him. At the heart and core of the call to Abram is this idea that there is a promise given to his children. So it's a natural question to say at this point, well, who exactly are those children? To whom are these promises being made? At this point in the passage, it's not entirely clear. It has not been specified. But as we move through the story, the focus becomes more clear. Look at Genesis chapter 13, verses 15 to 16. After the separation of Lot and Abram, what does it tell us? It tells us that all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. And so we know now that a great nation will come from Abram, but that that nation will also be his own offspring. Well, very good, the Jew may say. You've just proven my point. God at first said there would be a great nation in Genesis 12, and now in Genesis 13, he indicates that it would be his children. I'm a son of Abraham. That means these promises are mine. Not so. Because if we move further in the narrative, we find that this focus, this highlighting on exactly to whom these promises are made becomes an emphasis of the passage. And in fact, it comes to the heart of Abraham's own wrestling and struggle in his faith. How does it work? Well, it really works in three stages in the rest of the narrative. If we turn to Genesis 15, we see kind of the first stage or the first option for how this might come about. Because, of course, there's a problem. The problem is that Sarai is old and beyond the years of being able to bear a child. And Abraham is old as well. So what does he say? Well, he says in verse 2, after the Lord tells him he's going to grant him this very great reward. Abram asks, oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And then Abram says, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Now, these come in the form of a question, but it's hard to not think that this might be a bit of a suggestion on Abraham's part. In other words, it's as if he's saying to God, okay, you made me these great promises. All right, I see how this might work. Uh, here I have somebody in my house. I have no children, but here's Eliezer of Damascus. Maybe, maybe he's going to be the one through whom these promises will be fulfilled. Nope, that's not the way it's going to work. Because we know, and this is kind of the second stage, we know that God tells him, nope, not that man. That man is not going to be your heir, verse 4. Instead, a son coming from your own body. Okay, well, if you're a Jew in Paul's day, you're probably saying, okay, yeah, that, that's fine. I still am comfortable with that. Of course, it's going to be someone from his own body. I, I'm born of Abraham. I have his own flesh and blood. So that means these promises must truly be mine. Well, no, because that wasn't specific enough, was it? Because then what does Sarah and Abraham try to do? Well, if you go to Genesis 16, we see kind of their plan in this regard. Now, it's very interesting as you read Genesis chapter 16, because, of course, it contains an example of polygamy among the patriarchs. Abraham takes to himself another wife. And, of course, sometimes it's wondered how in the world could the patriarchs be polygamous? Well, the reality was God permitted it, although it was not that way from the beginning. And certainly today we can't use this passage to justify polygamy. But whose idea was it in the passage for Abraham to marry another wife? If you read through the passage, it was Sarai, Abram's wife who said to him in verse 2, the Lord has kept me from having children, so go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, of course, Abram listened to the voice of his wife, 
just as Adam listened to the voice of his wife in the garden, and in so doing, he sinned against God. But it was Sarah's plan that she hatched so that she could have children, legally speaking, through her. But is this the way God intended to fulfill his promise? No, it wasn't. In fact, after Hagar conceives, Sarai gets mad. She gets upset. She gets bitter towards Hagar because, of course, she has tried her whole life to conceive, and it hasn't worked. And now she very quickly conceives through Abraham. And that child is cast away. That child is excluded from blessedness. That child is put in the line of cursing because that child is the child born according to the flesh. Indeed, what God promises as we move through the story is that not only would he be a child of Abraham from his own body, but a child born of Sarah as well. And so in Genesis 6, Genesis 17, we have the story of the covenant of circumcision. Now stop for a minute. Understand what happened in Genesis 16. Abraham, through the power of his own flesh, tried to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. So what follows in Genesis 17? The covenant of circumcision. If there's ever a more graphic reminder that this promise will not be fulfilled by the power of Abram's own flesh, the covenant of circumcision, the cutting off of his foreskin, is. But what is emphasized here? We are told in Genesis 17, verse 16, that I will bless her, that is Sarah, and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. You see, the promise specifically given as we move through the narrative focuses more and more and more, not just on them being a descendant of Abraham, but a descendant of Abram and Sarai, and a descendant that can only be born through the supernatural power of the Spirit of God at work in them. The promise that God gave to Abram and to his seed, therefore, is through the supernatural spiritual children of Abraham. In fact, we know ultimately from Paul's letter to the Galatians that the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed, and that seed ultimately is Christ. And it is through Christ and through faith in him, through being joined in him, through being chosen with him, that they have their true identity as being spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham. I hope you can see by that brief survey through the story of Abraham why Paul makes the point that he does. There are children born according to the flesh, children born according to the promise. Never was it God's intention to grant all of visible Israel the eternal promises of salvation. God's promise was always given to the elect, the elect born according to the Spirit, the elect who exercised true faith in Christ, the elect to whom those promises were given who were joined in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, as Romans chapter 9, verse 7 indicates, quoting the book of Genesis, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And so it was for the Apostle Paul, not just those among the Jews, but also those among the Gentiles who believed could truly be children of Abraham. As the Apostle, Paul, as the Apostle John says in his gospel, children not born of the flesh or of the will of man, but children born of God, born again of the Holy Spirit through the electing power and plan and purpose of God. Indeed, we see that elective Israel illustrated in this time of Abraham in the children of the flesh and the children of the promise. Okay, the Jewish person might say, well, you've illustrated and you've shown that during the time of Abraham, maybe something like this happened. But you know what? That, that's not the way it happened in the rest of history. That's maybe just a one-off. Well, what does Paul do? Well, he moves to the next set of great patriarchs, namely Isaac with his two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now, again, as you read through these verses in Romans chapter 9, you'll see that he moves historically. He speaks first of Abraham's children, speaking of Isaac and Ishmael. But then in verse 10, he switches to Rebekah and to Isaac. And, of course, Rebekah and Isaac had sons. And what sons did they have? Kids, maybe you remember the names 
of the two twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah. What are they? Well, they're called Jacob and Esau. Jacob, of course, later gets the name Israel. But here in the passage that is being referenced, he is called Jacob. And guess what we see? Here we see the same principle of election. There are two sons, one born merely according to the flesh, the other according to the spirit. The one, the heir of the promise flowing from God's electing love, the other passed over and appointed to curse and judgment by God's sovereign decree. In other words, we have our third point, the principle of election with Jacob and Esau. Now, again, as we said, when we look at the life of Abraham, we see the focus on the issue of promise and faith. So in other words, we have election, God's eternal plan, illustrated in the ideas of promise and faith in the children. Well, here in the patriarch Jacob, we see a different idea emphasized. Again, Abraham, justification, and faith, and promise. With Jacob, on the other hand, it is the idea of growth and sanctification and grace. We see this early on where he's often lying and cheating and deceiving and dealing dishonestly with Uncle Laban. And then, of course, as he moves through the narrative, he becomes more and more aware of his own sins and shortcomings until the end of the story of Jacob when he tells us that few and evil have been the years of my sojournings and they've not attained to the years of the sojournings of my father. In other words, there's this growth, this gradual realization of his sinfulness and God's mercy to him. Well, what? how does Paul use the patriarch Jacob together with Esau in connection with election? Well, what he does is he helps to show us that God's eternal election and the difference between those whom he chooses and those whom he doesn't choose is not determined at all by anything that they do. In other words, the basic point here is that election is not based upon works. Now, again, why is this an important point for Paul to make? Well, because it was a very common Jewish mindset in his day, even as it's a very common human mindset, to think that we are chosen by God because we are better than other people. Now, I know most of us, we know Reformed theology well enough, we know the doctrine of total depravity, that we would never want to say that that's the case. But the reality is we often can act that way. We think of ourselves as those who come to church and do so faithfully, who seek to live a faithful life before God, and at times have to suffer and sacrifice to do so. And when we see others not doing it, we might resent them. We might look down on them. We might judge them. We not, might not be accepting of them. You see, our hearts always betray this sinful inclination, which is to think that the reason God loves us is because we're better than other people. Now, again, we might not say that, but... When we get upset at other people, when we're impatient with other people because they're not living the way we want, what are we doing except implicitly saying, well, I'm living the way God wants me to, and I am better than you, and so therefore you need to be more like me. That's all of us in our sinful hearts. Well, Paul wants to make clear, and God wants to make clear, that his choice of this children according to the Spirit is not based on works, not even in the slightest sense. Now, again, the Apostle Paul here appeals to Genesis chapter 25. And, of course, that chapter and the discussion of the birth of Jacob and Esau is couched within a reiteration of the distinction between Isaac and Ishmael. Because, of course, in Genesis 25, we are reading the story of Abraham and Isaac. But then in verse 12, we read the generations of Abraham's son Ishmael. So it starts with that contrast between the child of the spirit and the child of the flesh, Isaac and Ishmael, reminding us of that difference. But then at the end of the story, we read of the birth of two more sons, Jacob and Esau. And of course, in the story, we read that, that Isaac's wife, Rebekah, was barren. And by, answering God's, or by God answering their prayers, they brought children to them. Again, a reminder that this seed will come about through the supernatural power of God, not through their natural strength because they were weak in their bodies to produce children, but instead of instead through God's strength. But what happens is that twins are conceived. And in verse 22, it tells us that babies jostled or were fighting with one another in the womb. And of course, she asks, why is this happening? And so the Lord says to her, there are two nations in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated, 
One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. And when the two boys come out, the first two that comes out is red, and he's hairy, and they name him Esau. And the next one that comes out grasps his heel, and so he names him Jacob. And Isaac, of course, is 60 years old when they give birth. And all throughout their lives, there is this antithesis and this conflict between them. Now, what does Paul say to interpret this passage? Well, what he tells us is that there was nothing to distinguish at that time Jacob from Esau that would make God choose the one over the other. Let's look at the specific verse that the apostle or the specific phrase the apostle uses. He says that Rebekah's children had one and the same father, Isaac, in verse 11, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. In other words, the apostle appeals to this passage to prove that their election, our election, is not because our works of righteousness made us different or better than somebody else. In fact, the declaration of that promise that the older will serve the younger came before either were born. Indeed, there's nothing in us that can cause us to differ from another person. We are all sinners. As the Apostle Paul has said, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, it is true that those who are elect, those whom God has chosen in Christ, he has chosen unto holiness. And in their lives, there should be the fruit of that holiness, evidencing the work of grace in their lives. But that holiness, that faith, those good works are not the cause of election. Instead, they are the fruit of election. And if we want to see that illustrated in any patriarch's life more clearly, I think it's the story of the patriarch Jacob. Because we only have to glance through the story of Jacob in the Old Testament, see how he dealt with his family members, see what he did to amass for himself a great number of animals from his uncle Laban, to see how he dealt with his own children during the story of Joseph, to see all kinds of sins and shortcomings in the story of Jacob. His life is one of gradual sanctification. He knew at the end of his life that it was not because of his righteousness, because he had very little that God chose him. It was because of God's mercy and his grace. Nevertheless, it's important that we walk through this phrase in verse 11 so that we might fully appreciate the force and clarity and precision that the Apostle Paul uses to make this point. Look at what he says. First of all, he says, though they were not yet born. Now, of course, the reference here is to that word of promise that it was given before they were yet born. But if we were to see how this was reflected in God's eternal plan, we're confronted with this principle. Prior to our having existence, God chooses whether to save us or not to save us. Now, let me ask you this question. Can something that doesn't have existence yet, can it do anything to move God to save it? That's impossible. All we are in God's eternal plan is a thought. We are that which one day will have being, but we currently have no being. It is the height of absurdity to say that something that has no being or existence, let alone something that does not yet have the ability to make moral choices, can on the basis of those moral choices root and ground their election. In other words, election is not based on our good works. Not only does he say it's before they were born or had existence, he also then goes on and says, had, had done nothing good or bad. Now, it's certainly true we're all born in this world with a sinful nature, and that inclination to sin condemns us. But we typically, if we're going to differ or show how we might be better than somebody else, we actually have to do something. Well, what can babies in the womb do that could truly be constituted a moral choice? They don't, haven't yet developed faculties of thinking, of acting, of doing any kind of thing. Relatively speaking, we would say on the human level, not on the divine level because of their original sin, on the human level, we would say they're innocent. They've done nothing good or bad. 
Well, God's decision to appoint one to salvation and the other not precedes and is irrespective of whether one has done anything good or bad. In fact, if we were to measure them on whether they did something good or bad, if that served as the basis of anything, it would serve as the basis of their condemnation. But note the third phrase the apostle uses. Because here, of course, we might still try to sneak in in some way and say, okay, sure, but maybe there's some room to have good work somewhere be the basis of the election. We can't squeeze it in because the Apostle Paul puts these two things in total antithesis. He says it's not because of works, but instead it's because of what? It's because of him who calls. Or as he says elsewhere, it is not of him who wills or runs, but on God who shows mercy. In other words, what the Apostle is doing is he's linking together faith by which we have redemption and salvation in Christ, to the effectual call of God, to the eternal electing plan of God to put that whole thing in motion. And he's saying it all goes back to God's free electing choice. The word of promise, the word of redemption is governed by and controlled by God's electing purpose. And indeed, the final way he confirms this is by his appeal to the prophet Malachi. Malachi Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What's the significance of this? Well, first of all, let's keep in view that he's moved now from the patriarchal period, the book of Genesis, all the way to the prophets. And he's saying from beginning to end, the Bible has a consistent message about this idea. But the other reason he appeals to it is because of the antithesis it makes. Jacob, through God's mercy and compassion, is the recipient of his electing love. But Esau is reprobate and passed over and instead counted as hated. Now, we have to ask ourselves, and Paul will get into this in detail in the next passage, which we'll look at next week. How can God do that? How can, before all eternity, God say that he has appointed someone to condemnation such that he hates them. Well, there's an important distinction we need to make. And that's this distinction between God passing over somebody and choosing not to save them, but then on the other hand, his appointing them to wrath. So there's passing over, choosing not to save, and there's appointing them to wrath. And what we find in the Bible, and this is helpfully summarized in our confession of faith, the passing over is based on God's sovereign free decision, irrespective of works, whether good or bad. But the appointing to wrath is done because of their sin. They are passed over by God's free choice and appointed to wrath because of their sinfulness. Nevertheless, what do we see here? Clearly illustrated, not just in the book of Genesis, in the time of Abraham, but also in the time of Isaac and in the time of the prophets in the book of Malachi and even now in the Apostle Paul's day and even here today with us. For what are we told in the book of Galatians? As they wrestle with this very thing, the Judaizers coming in to corrupt the gospel. We're told by the Apostle Paul that there was indeed in chapter 4, verses 21 and following, that there are children according to the flesh and children according to the promise. And as verse 29 indicates, at that time, the son born the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. And it is the same today. And so it is, we must have this perspective, not just between the church and the world, but we must have it within the church itself. We are not shocked or surprised when we see people within the visible church leave it or abandon it. We are not shocked or surprised when we see believers perhaps fall into heinous sin. Such has been the story of God's visible church throughout history. And when we see that, we might think to ourselves, has God's word failed? This pastor has done something terrible. How could that happen when he was preaching and teaching the gospel? Or this church seems to be falling apart. 
How can that be happening when the gospel is being preached there? You might be tempted to think, has God's word failed? The answer is no, it hasn't. Even as it was then, so it is now. God's word will accomplish what he purposed for it. And that purpose is the salvation of his elect in all the world, in every generation. Far from discouraging us, this reality should encourage us. Far from making us lazy or thinking that all of it will automatically happen, it should give us even greater faith in the power of God's word. For that is the means he uses to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth until they are gathered together for that great day in the marriage supper of the Lamb when all true Israelites, not just from among the Jews, but also among the Gentiles, gather together rejoicing in their Redeemer, the Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, for its teaching and revealing to us this plan of redemption that stretches all the way back into eternity and your free electing choice of us. We thank you, Lord, for how that is so clearly evidenced and manifested in the era of the patriarchs, but also the prophets. And may, Lord, it be encouragement and strength to us as we see that plan unfold among us today. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we'll respond to the word of God as we turn to hymn 469 in the Red Trinity Hymnal. It's a beautiful hymn, goes by, and it's on the doctrine of election. It goes under the title, How Sweet and Awesome is the Place. It's number 469. Let's now close together in prayer 
after which we'll sing the doxology together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for drawing near to us through your word and through faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. May, Lord, you bless us, your elect children, and indeed bless us with your presence, that of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May it be with us and remain upon us this day and forever. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.